Let go, forward. Fire away. Let go, aft. Mr. Kendall, you're new aboard the Tangma, and I'm glad to have you. But understand one thing from the start. This voyage to Savannah Lamar means a devil of a lot to all of us. Without it, the Tangma would probably be tied up, rotting. Captain Goddard of the Tangma clenched his teeth on the worn briar and continued to pace alongside me as we waited for the passengers to come aboard. To the skipper of the Tangma, I was the new mate who'd reported the day before. But that wasn't the whole story, not by a long shot. I watched a gull scream high above the deck, motionless in its flight against the wind squall. Rain clouds pressed down on the coat hanger arc of the bridge. It had been raining that night in London, two months before, when I'd first heard of the million dollar estate of Victor Wherryman and the Tangmar's projected voyage from Sydney to Jamaica. Go on, Kendall. Right, sir. You'd better stay in the car, Dobson. Look after that cold. Yes, sir. It's... It was just over here by the embankment that they found Slavin, Kendall. Too late to do anything for him. Colonel Hacking... Uh, uh... Wait a minute, Dirk. Let me finish. I've chosen you for this assignment because of your merchant navy background. You have got a mate's ticket, haven't you? Yes. Well, you're going back to sea. You will join the Tangmar in Sydney. How does that sound? Staggering. Yes, I thought it might. Well, this was the place. Lonely spot to finish up as violently as poor Slavin did. Yeah, but what connection is there between the death of Slavin and my flying to Australia to join the crew of the Tangmar? That's why you're going, to find out. Come on, let's go back to the car. Miserable night to be revisiting the scene of the crime, isn't it? It was a blunt instrument job. Slavin was pretty well unrecognisable. Not a pleasant sight at all. Colonel Hacking, isn't it more of an ordinary Scotland Yard job? Um, how does Interpol come into it? We don't, actually, except that we've got the right man for the job. You. I went round to see the commissioner this afternoon, and we agreed that you're it. Sorry about that uh, leave you were looking forward to. I have to defer it. All right, Dobson, let's go. My rooms. Well, that's where it happened, Dirk. Now we'll go to my place and I'll bring you up to date. Fascinating case, really. And I've uh, like a little brand of scotch you might care to try. You look as if you could do with one. Um, how are you going to spend your leave anyway, Dirk? Yeah. Thanks. Fishing. Sheer waste of time. Much better for you to be working. Cheers. Well, if I'd left town tonight instead of going to my club, I'd have been out of sight and out of mind. Some other poor blighter would have had to be the bunny. Oh, I'd have located you, Kendall. How can Interpol find anyone if we can't keep track of our own chappies? <sighs> well, half your luck anyway. If I had the chance, I'd be going myself. But since the Paul Saracen affair, I haven't been out of England. Oh, that reminds me. It uh, seems a long time ago. Sign of the scimitar. Go again if you like, Kendall. I shall be a minute. Thanks. I will. Remember Brian Darrington, don't you? He's become a father. But... Oh, hello. Is it you, Brian? Hacking. I'm sorry. I, I, I won't be able to make it after all. What? Oh, thanks. I'd be delighted. You give my regards to Claire... Bye. Now I'm a godfather, Kendall. <laughs> you see, each of us roped in for something we don't want. Now, let's see. Um, I'd better start with Peter Slavin, I think. It is a good scotch, Colonel. Here. Thanks. You can't put me off that way, my boy. Now, pay attention. 
Firstly, Slavin was killed three weeks ago, on the 14th of May, on the day that his photograph had been published in the paper, asking him to contact a law firm by the name of Brancher, Brancher and Smith in Jamaica. Jamaica? That's right. The firm had been searching for Slavin for weeks. Why? Because under the terms of Victor Werriman's will, he's the old fellow who's behind Slavin's death, in my opinion, you see, um, when he died, Werriman left an estate valued at well over a million pounds and an enormous plantation in a place called... Um, oh, just wait a minute, I've uh, got the name here somewhere. Yes, here we are. Savannah Lamar, on the island of Jamaica. Apparently he was a somewhat eccentric chappy, this Werriman. Bachelor... Not that that makes him eccentric, I thoroughly prove. He had um, no relatives, and having made his money in diamonds some years ago, he travelled extensively until he settled in Savannah Lamar. What's that got to do with Slavin? During those travels, Quirriman naturally met a number of people. Slavin was one of them. And because of that, this eccentric millionaire left Slavin part of his fortune? Along with five other people. A million pounds, Dirk, to be divided equally amongst them when they reach Jamaica. If they reach Jamaica. Why shouldn't they? Well, Slavin won't, will he? Hmm. It was Wedeman's express wish that these people, from varying walks of life, all of whom had given him pleasure in one way or another, should travel from Sydney to Jamaica together, in order that they should come to know each other. Wedeman, somewhat illogically, assumed that because he liked them, uh, they should like each other. I see. In the Tang Bar, as the ship chartered to make the voyage. A voyage well worthwhile, since Victor Wedeman left £5,000 to cover the cost. The owners of the Tang Bar are not fools, Kendall. With cargoes as difficult to locate as they are, freight prices cut to ribbons, this is a godsend for them. But Peter Slavin's death wasn't. Oh. And so to protect their interests and these five beneficiaries, I'm to join the Tangmar's mate, eh? You've already arranged it. Yes, Dirk, you leave England in two days' time. Fly to Sydney and report to, um... Oh, yes, uh, Captain John Robert Goddard, the skipper. Uh, what about the fellow I'm relieving? Oh, he won't suffer, the owners assure me. Anything else you want to know, Dirk? Anything else? You, you mean that's all? Generally speaking, Yes. Oh, yes, yes, there was something else. The Tangmar sailed from Tilbury Docks the day before we found Peter Slavin. The day before? Well, then... I didn't say the killer was aboard the Tangmar, but he might be when you leave Sydney, mightn't he? But I think that's enough for tonight, Dirk. I'll see you again in the morning. Good night. What? Oh, uh, oh good night, Colonel. You've given me plenty to think about. And uh, there is one other thing. Yeah. We decided Victor Wedeman was eccentric, didn't we? Well, should any beneficiary fail to arrive in Jamaica on the Tangmar and on the date specified, his or her share will go to the others. So already they're all considerably better off by virtue of Slavin's death, aren't they? Good night, Doug. Seems odd to me, Mr. Kendall. The owner is deciding to replace my first officer at this time. That's the cheapest way of getting me to Jamaica, I think, sir. Why? Well, I'm only with you for this voyage. In Jamaica, I expect to find orders to join another ship there. Oh, this chopping and changing of the crew isn't a good thing, Kendall. Engineers coming aboard, sir. Hmm. Going to meet some of our precious cargo at last, eh, Kendall? Oh, come on, let's get it over. Turning me into a blasted passenger skipper at my time of life. Empty holes and full cabins. Huh. Why the devil they couldn't get us a decent ship, I don't know, Shadow. This tub looks like a... Oh, they don't. Captain. What? Where? Hmm. Your name Goddard? Yes, and... Challoner. Major Basil Challoner, this is my daughter Sharon. Send someone down to get our stuff, will you? Then show us to our cabin. What does my ship look like, Major? Well, why, John? Um... I think it looks very nice, Captain. I'm sure we'll be very comfortable. I hope so, Miss Challoner. You're my first officer, Mr. Kendall. How do you do? How do you do, madam? Mr. Kendall, we'll show you to your cabins. Chips, get that luggage aboard, will you? Okay, skipper. This way, Major. Miss Challoner. Coming out here to Australia, having to pick up a ship like this. First good seaward capsizer, I should think. 
This is your cabin, Miss Challoner. Actually, it's a little smaller than your father's. As soon as he comes aboard, I'll have your stuff sent down. I wish we'd come from England by ship, but Daddy insisted on flying. Said we might as well look at Sydney while we had the chance. Your father doesn't seem awfully impressed. I loved it. It's exciting, and I wish we were staying longer. Mr. Kendall, you mustn't mind Father. He just seems abrupt and... Yes, of course. Is there anything I can get you? If not, I'd better get back on deck and meet the rest of the passengers. Of course, I'm making this trip under false pretenses. It's Daddy who has to go to Jamaica. He knew this man, Wherryman, in India when he was in the army there. Really? Yes. You see, Daddy was a subaltern at the time, and this Victor Wherryman came to the mess for dinner. Sharon, I've told you before I don't like to tell you my business to every Tom, Dick and Harry. And since you know nothing about the army, there's no need to mention it. Now, you, your name's Kendall, isn't it? Yes, Major. Well, you get back on deck where you belong. Father. And stay away from my daughter's cabin, Kendall. If there's anything you want, come to me. Now get out. That was how it began in Sharon Challoner's cabin aboard the Tangmar. I'd met the first of the beneficiaries under the terms of Victor Wherryman's will. But there were four more to come. Four people who stood to gain a fortune, providing they lived through the passage of the Tangmar. Get that luggage aboard and stow it away, Bolton. The story of a ship and its cargo of death. Kendall, if the rest of these passengers are anything like Major Challoner... This voyage from Sydney to Savannah Lamar is going to be a devil of a lot tougher than I thought. Captain Goddard's weather beaten face was set in a scowl as we leaned over the after deck rail of the Tang Ma, watching the wharves and waiting for the rest of the passengers. All told, there would be six of them the Major and his daughter Sharon who were already aboard, a Miss Ilona Fedorov, Dr. Martin Lawler, Ben Miller, and a certain Edwin Tucker. Six people bound together by the will of the late Victor Wherryman. I thought back two months to the last time I'd talked with Colonel Hacking of Interpol in his office on the embankment. I'd been told by the colonel that I was being flown to Australia to join the crew of the Tang Ma. All that remained was the final briefing. Sit down, Kendall. Sleep well? No, scrappily, sir. I was too busy thinking of everything you told me last night. Yes, I imagined you might be. Oh, while I think of it, uh, here are your plane tickets. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, getting back to Peter Slavin for a moment. Yes? In the three weeks since he was killed, no clues have come to light. Nothing. Except that he was to get a sixth share, in effect, in Wherryman's estate. We know how he died and when, but why has yet to be proved. But you're pretty convinced his killer will be aboard the Tangmar when she sails from Sydney Harbour. If my theory is correct that Slavin was killed to prevent him sharing in the estate, yes. For one reason, Dirk, it'll be the killer's last chance to narrow the field, as it were. He must act between Sydney and Savannah Lamar, Jamaica. Isn't it odd that all these beneficiaries should be living in Australia? Not all of them do. Slavin didn't. And according to Scotland Yard's information, another of the beneficiaries flew to Australia a few days ago, apparently to wait for the Tangmar. A Major Basil Challoner and his daughter Sharon. Then he was in England when Slavin was killed? Along with 60 million other people, yes. Oh, where the devil's that file? I've got the details on all of them here somewhere. Not much, but it might help you. Oh, really, Dobson's devotion to cleaning up this desk of mine is something touching, Mr. 
Jolly nuisance. In tray, out trays, and nothing that I want when I want. Oh, wait a minute. Here we are. <clears throat> uh, Chaloner Basil, ex major Indian Army, MC H55, Kyber Rifles, 1929-34, Staff College, Quetta, Middle East, 39, invalided out, 42. Thereafter known to have shunned all contact with former Army associates. Retired to a cottage in Petworth, Sussex. Source of income not known, but small army pension probable. Well, what about the others? Well, uh, here we are. Um, Ilona Fedorov, age 32, white Russian, migrated to Australia 1938. Unmarried, parents died in Australia. That's all we have on her. Hmm. The rest? Dr. Martin Lawler, aged 48, FRCS, went to Australia, 1948, successful surgeon, bachelor. Well, we know where he met, Wherryman, in Wilton, Yorkshire, 1937, Lawler's first practice. Had to operate on Wherryman in a hurry instead of carting him to York. How did you know that? The solicitors in Jamaica, Brancher, Brancher and Smith. Apparently, old Wherryman was always chuckling about it, how he'd convinced Lawler that he was a pauper and couldn't pay. He never did, either. Thought it the devil of a joke. Why? <laughs> Apparently he wanted to see if the young doctor would take the same pains with a pauper as he would with a wealthy client. <laughs> Pretty drastic way of finding out. <laughs> uh, here's now. Ben Miller, aged 40. A report on him from the Australian police. His record goes back to his childhood. One conviction after another for petty theft. His own whole list of them here. Known as the amateur in underworld circles because of regularity of arrest. <laughs> Apparently the police over there will be happy to see the last of him. Well, where the devil would he have met a man like Wherryman? No idea. And here's another. Edwin Tucker, age 50, convicted poisoner. Convicted of killing his wife in 1935. Served 15 years of life sentence. There you are, it's the lot, Dirk. Interesting assortment, aren't they? Well, do I protect or suspect them? Both, and any other passengers aboard. And, of course, the crew, and even Goddard the skipper. Scotland Yard want this case solved, Kendall. It's my guess you'll find the answer aboard the Tangmar. And you'd be delighted if Interpol do it smartly. Be a feather in our cap. Good luck, Kendall. See you when you get back. Don't forget to catch that plane, will you? Uh... Looks like one of them coming up the gangplank now, Kendall. Seems a downside pleasanter than Challoner at all events. It'd be Dr. Lawler, I should think. The first time the Tang Mars had a fully qualified doctor on hand. You think we might need one, Captain Goddard? Huh? No, why should we? Captain Goddard, my name's Lawler. Martin Lawler. Uh, glad to meet you, Doctor. This is Kendall, my first officer. Uh -huh, Mr. Kendall. How do you do, sir? I'll show you to your cabin. Oh, uh, you... no, no, thanks. Um, let it wait. Do you mind? I'll stay up here on deck for a while. <laughs> Captain Goddard, you don't know what this voyage means to me. I've got a pretty fair idea. Oh, not the money. It's the first holiday I've had in years. I was beginning to hate that surgery of mine. Ah, amazing. Fresh air. No antiseptics. Wonderful. <laughs> I, um, I hope you've got a fit crew, Captain. I don't want to even think of treating a patient between here and Jamaica. No, oh, they're fit enough. Too darn lazy to do anything to hurt themselves. Bolton! Those two men fainting are sleeping. So is Skipper. You lazy misfortune. Yes, if Sunday. it hadn't been for this Get letter from Jamaica telling me about my share in Victor Melanie's estate, well, I wouldn't have had an excuse to leave. Hmm. Captain Goddard tells me it's a pretty worthwhile excuse, sir. Yes, I suppose it is very worthwhile. Hmm. Yes, it was funny how I met Wherryman, back in Wilton in Yorkshire. I was a struggling young doctor. Can I get someone to bring your luggage aboard, Mr. Miller? Well, me? Luggage? Are you kidding? Got it all here in this little bag. Yeah, not a bad little cabin. Bit like a police cell. Yeah, sure there ain't one hidden under the bunk. Better have a look. And up. Ah, safe as houses are going to be. All the way to Jamaica, not a copper in sight. <laughs> hey, you see those two plain clothes boys down on the wharf? Guard of honor for me, they are. Make sure I leave Sydney. <laughs> hey, what'd you say your name was again? Kendall. Yeah, well, listen, Kendall. 
This is the start of a new life for me. Wow, all that money just can't wait. It must have come as a surprise to you, this letter from Jamaica. Are you kidding? No, I still reckon it's some kind of joke. But if they like to pay my passage for me to find out, why should I complain? I don't remember anyone called Worryman. I bet I never tried to lift his wallet. Mr. Miller, do you always tell people that you've been in... Uh, well, in jail? <laughs> well, why not? Nothing to be ashamed of. That's what I call my college background. I graduated from prison, I did. No more. Hey, look. Talking to prisoners, giving me claustrophobia. Get back on deck. Hey, and shut the door as we go out. Never trust the people you find on ships. The ones that look honest are the worst. Uh, Captain Goddard, you will look after dear Edwin, won't you? Mrs. Tucker, we... Tuker, uh... Captain. It's pronounced Tuker. Oh. Well, uh... You see, Captain, I worry about Edwin so much. He's not very strong, you see. And if he should be seasick, why... You promise me he'll be all right, Captain. Mrs. Tucker, we... Tuker, Captain. It's pronounced Tuker. We have a doctor travelling with us, is what I was trying to say. Oh, oh, then people do get sick at sea, Captain. Is that what you mean? Hm. I knew I should have made this trip with you, Edwin, dear. Now I'll be watching more than ever. Mr. Kendall, will you show this passenger to his cabin? Uh, this way, Mr. Tucker. Tuker, Mr. Kendall. It's pronounced Tuker. And please lock my trunk for me. It's time I was leaving for the ship. Oh, Lola, won't you change your mind? Even though it's not too late, we could be married at Kate, once and then... for the last time, there was never any question of marrying you. We've had some fun together, that's true, but that is the end of it. Fun? Is that all you have to say? My trunk, Keith, please. The taxi will be here any moment. Is it just the money alone? Oh, what else is there? I'm sick and tired of depending on people like you, Keith. Waiting for men to fall in love with me and buy the thing I want. Now I will be able to get it for myself. You mean there have been others? <laughs> you did not for a moment imagine you were the first, did you? Keith, you are a charming boy, but so very young. I can't let you go like this. There is no way in which you can stop me. There is one way, Lena. This way. A gun? Oh, please don't be so childish. You're like a little boy deprived of the sweet he wants so badly. Now put it away, my dear. You would not have the courage to use it anyway. Didn't you ever love me, Alona? Mm, I was fond of you. Please, lock my trunk. You're not going anywhere. No. I'm going now, my dear. I will wait for the taxi downstairs. If it's any consolation to you, I think you had much better taste than the others. <laughs> what is it they say? That each man kills the thing he loves? Men do, Keith. But not children. Goodbye. Ilona Fedorov had still to come aboard before the Tangmar could cast off. Before the passenger list was complete, my assignment would begin. The voyage from Sydney to Savannah Lamar, Jamaica. These were the people who stood to gain by the death of Peter Slavin. The one beneficiary who would never report for this passage of the Tangmar. Kendall, is there any sign of Miss Fedorov yet? Still haven't come aboard, Skipper. I'll be in my cabin. If she's not aboard in half an hour, we'll sail without her. <laughs> you, are you the captain of this ship? No. I then don't. take me to him. And I think that your crew might show more respect to your passengers. I'd watched Ilona Fedorov step from the cab that had brought her to the wharf. And in the long moment she'd taken to smooth her skirt over slender, shapely legs, work on the wharf came to a standstill. 
I'd never seen a woman command and retain so much attention and accept it so casually as her right. She stepped in front of me now, waiting for me to take her to the captain, with the faintest of smiles playing at the corners of her mouth. The combination of auburn hair and black costuming, the snow-white gloves and bag, spelt out a different kind of danger to the one Colonel Hacking had warned me of. As I led her below, I wondered how many other men had waited at the whim of Ilona Fedorov. Yes? Our missing passenger, Captain. And bring her in. Miss Ilona Fedorov, Captain Goddard. Miss Fedorov, are your things aboard? This gentleman has arranged that. I would like to go to my cabin at once. I'm rather tired. So am I, with waiting. Weren't you aware that we sailed this afternoon? I was unavoidably delayed. Mr. Kendall, I'll show Miss Fedorov to her cabin. But how kind of you, Captain. I do not wish to be a nuisance, it's but... It's not a question of kindness. My first officer is needed on deck. All right, Kendall. We can be ready for sea in half an hour, Skipper. Excellent. I'll join you in a few minutes. Right, sir. Mm. There is a sense of efficiency about sailors that appears to me greatly, Captain Goddard. Miss Fedorov, I think we better understand each other from the start. I don't like carrying passengers, but Tangmar is first and foremost a cargo ship. Cargos normally don't keep me waiting. That's why I prefer them. But Captain Goddard... Is... Since I've accepted this charter to Savannah Lamar, there's nothing I can do about that now. I've contracted to take you and the rest of Victor Wedderman's beneficiaries to Jamaica, and that's the end of it. But I'm not commanding an ocean-going playground. Is that clear? I'll do everything in my power to make your voyage as pleasant as possible. But I expect you to be aboard when I'm ready to sail. Captain, you are very attractive when you are stern. Miss Fedorov, the Tangma could have been outside the heads by now. You may think you had some good reason for delaying my departure, but don't let it happen at any of our ports of call or you'll find yourself stranded. If you'll come with me now, I'll take you to your cabin. Bosun, double-check the hatch covers. We'll be taking some heavy seas. All right, Mr. Kendall. Take on the hand covers, will we? Get the gangplank inboard. Shall we come on the board, sir? Go right. Hold it. Bring them to the bridge. Right. What the devil would this be? Kendall, you've seen the passengers. What do you think of them? They seem all right, sir. Did the owners tell you there should have been one other? A certain Peter Slaven? Yes. He would have had Miss Chellinus, Kevin. Oh, let's hope there won't be any more trouble. You afraid there might be? Five people sent into Jamaica to share in a fortune. I suppose you know the old chap Wedderman stipulated that any one of them who didn't arrive automatically loses his share. The owners did say something about it, Skipper, but... Mm. Slavin's not going to be there when that million is carved up. I just want to make sure that my passengers are. Keep your eyes skin, Kendall. The first sign of any funny business, report to me. I'm going to Captain on the bridge, sir. Okay, thanks. Uh, Captain Goddard? Yes? Uh, glad to know you. The name's Lee Blake. I want you to take me to Jamaica. You what? That's right, Captain. Oh, there's nothing fishy about it. I've got my papers, passport, and so on. And I can afford to pay whatever you think it's worth. Aren't you cutting it pretty fine? I mean, what's so important about making the trip in the Tangma? Well, let's say I'm restless. And I don't like big passenger liners. Well, is it a deal? Mr. Blake, this ship has been chartered for a special reason. My passengers are all aboard, and we're preparing to sail now. Yeah, that's the reason I'm here. I want to sail now. What do you think, Kendall? Well, sounds peculiar to me, but... <laughs> Afraid I'm running from the police? And stop worrying. I've been globetrotting since I left the States two and a half years ago. I've been in Sydney for more than six months now. I figure that's long enough when I've never seen Jamaica. Mr. Kendall, have the gangplank secured. What do you mean, we're taking him? It'll be a relief to have a passenger on this ship that I don't have to wet nurse. If you know what I mean. Come on down to my cabin, Mr. Blake. We'll check your story there. Yeah. And you can vouch for him? Good. I see. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Well, satisfied, Captain? I suppose so, yes. Well, you've checked with my hotel, my bank. It's sort of ringing the police. You better accept me, I guess. All right, Blake, I'll take you. Fine. Thanks, Captain. There are six passengers besides yourself. So you ought to find someone to talk to and make... Yeah, come in. 
I'd like a word with you, Captain Goddard. Oh, it's you, Chaloner. What is it? In private. Do you mind, Mr. Blake? No, no, not at all. And thanks. I'll get someone to fix you up with a cabin as soon as I'm through with the Major. Great. Well, Major Chaloner. Who is that? A passenger. Or Jamaica? I'm not heading for Malta, Major. I understood that the ship had been chartered for a special reason. Another passenger is going to seriously affect my comfort and my daughter's. Is that what you wanted to see me about? It is. I haven't travelled all the way from England to spend weeks sitting down for meals with a man who's probably on the run. Doesn't it strike you as strange, sir, that he should come aboard just now? I've known it happened before. Haven't you ever had to make a dash to get a train connection, Major? Never. In the army, sir, one learns to be punctual. How did you hear about Blake anyway, Major? He hasn't been aboard longer than half an hour. I heard some of the crew talking on deck. Well, it's bad enough having to make this trip at all. But at least we don't have to make it in the company of a fellow like that. If you ask me... I have If you ask me... This man, Blake, isn't telling the truth. It is my belief that he's here because of the money. Major Challoner, I can assure you that Lee Blake knows nothing of the reasons for this voyage. I'm taking him aboard because I've made inquiries and I'm satisfied. That you can pocket a few extra pounds for yourself by doing so. I think you'd better return to your cabin. Either you put this fellow ashore, or my daughter and I leave this ship. Then leave and good riddance to you. Why, you... I'll write to the owners about this, I'll... That sounds like our tug, Major Challoner. If you're going ashore, you better make it fast. Between leaving the ship and writing, you're going to be a busy man. With the Tangmar leaving harbour, I'm going to be busy too, Major Challoner. Now get out of my cabin. Let go, forward. Let go, aft. Right. Did Major Challoner leave the ship, Mr. Kendall? No. Mm. And I wish he had. Have served him right if he hadn't reached Jamaica. Slow astern. Slow astern, sir. I didn't think the unpleasant old fool would risk losing out on his inheritance. Yeah, I fixed up a cabin for Blake. Good. There she goes. There he is, she goes, Kevin. As though I haven't got enough in my mind without putting up with Chaloner. Well, his daughter rather makes up for it, so. Does she? She'd need to. Hmm. Looks like dirty weather coming up. You mean at sea or aboard, Captain? Both. Out of port, Quartermaster. Out of port, it is, sir. I checked on Blake before Challoner came to my cabin. He's all right. I'm glad to hear it. Thank heaven we're getting to sea. I hate being in port. Arm ahead. Arm ahead, Skipper. Guns clear, Skipper. Now, all we've got to do is get this bunch of passengers safely to Jamaica. And the less of Challoner I see on this voyage, the better I'll like it. Helm amidships. Helm amidships. Yeah. And there it is, Kendall. I never believe I'm leaving Sydney Harbour until I see that bridge over me. Yeah, I'll take the watch. <laughs> you better check that our passengers are comfortable. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Kendall. We're looking for you. Well, Mr. Blake, you're getting pretty fresh up here already. I thought it was only the passengers who watched the sea. Uh, it's a long time since I was at sea. Yeah, I know. Tell you what I wanted to know, Kendall. Have you worked out who killed Peter Slavin yet? Storm clouds were gathering on the horizon, and through the flying spray as we hit the rollers outside the heads, I stared at Lee Blake. So he'd known all the time. 
He lied to Captain Goddard. And now he'd admitted that he knew why I was aboard for this passage of the Tangma. You seem kind of surprised, Mr. Kendall. Seems like a straightforward enough question to me. Who did kill Peter Slavin? You know yet? If you do know, Mr. Kendall, I'd advise you to tell me. Might save a lot of trouble all around. It seemed as though the two bells of the afternoon watch came from a long way off. As I stood there looking at Lee Blake, the American who'd revealed his reason for being aboard the Tangmar just one hour from port. Ahead of us was a voyage of 8,546 miles. A month at sea at least, allowing that the Tangmar of 6,000 tons cruised at its maximum speed of 12 knots. And aboard the Tangmar, six people vitally concerned with the will of the late Victor Wedeman of Savannah Lamar, Jamaica. And now, Lee Blake, who'd paid for his passage as we were preparing to leave Sydney Harbour, had come up to me as I leaned on the deck rail watching the storm clouds on the horizon. I guess I've given you an even bigger surprise than I figured on, Kendall. But I know that Peter Slavin was murdered in England nearly three months ago. Have you got a cigarette, Blake? I could do with one. Yeah, sure. American, all right? Thanks. All right? Yes, thanks. Well, perhaps you better tell me what else you know. Or imagine you know. Okay. Your name is Dirk Kendall, ex-merchant Navy Interpol agent. You're serving as first officer on the Tangmar because Colonel Hacking, your superior, arranged it. For this one voyage, to find the killer of Peter Slavin and protect the lives of the five beneficiaries who are aboard. Six, if we count Major Challenge's daughter. And you, Blake? <laughs> I'm not a guy who goes to sea because he likes to travel. I gathered that. Just why are you aboard? Colonel Hacking thought it might be a good idea. In case you got into any trouble. I don't have any way of checking that, do I? Well, you'll have to take my word for it. When did you see Hacking? Two weeks ago. In London. But I thought... That I'd been living in Sydney for some time? Yes, Hacking arranged that. An obliging hotelier and bank manager. After all, I didn't want Captain Goddard to know that I'd just left England. So you're with Interpol yourself? No, no, I'm not. Were well, you a private detective or something? No. And what? My father owns the Tangmar. If there's going to be trouble aboard, I want to protect our interests. Oh, of course. Blake. The Blake Shipping Company. But how come Goddard doesn't know you? Well, he's always dealt with the old man. Until now, I've kept well away from the family business, but with the death of Slavin, my father decided it was time I showed some interest. So you went to see Hacking? I was carted off to see him, pretty forcibly. Scotland Yard didn't like the idea of an American snooping around asking questions. So I was duly ushered into that dingy office of Hacking's and told to keep my nose clean. <laughs> very politely, I'm sure. Oh, Very. However, after I'd told my story and why I was interested, Colonel Hacking decided I might as well put my enthusiasm to some use and, in the process of looking after the family interests, keep a watchful eye on one Dirk Kendall. Have you met the other passengers? I've seen them. I've met Major Challoner. Well, you want your identity kept secret, of course. I do. I'm simply Lee Blake, a yank with itchy feet. But I'll be on hand if you need me, Kendall. Remember that. I will. It's nice to have you aboard, Blake. Oh, by the way, I've got one piece of news for you. Dr. Martin Lawler was in England at the same time Slavin was killed, attending a medical conference. See you around, Dick. Mr. Kendall, isn't it considered polite for the captain to join the passengers on the first night out at least? Well, Captain Goddard asked me to make his apologies. He's taking the first watch. I relieve him at eight. But Miss Challoner, isn't your father joining us for dinner? He's... Uh, well, not feeling awfully well. <laughs> Touch of seasickness, eh? Poor cow. Uh, like me to go down afterwards and cheer him up, miss? You're very kind, Mr. Miller, but, well, thanks all the same. Ben, that's the name. Call me Ben, miss. 
Oh. After some of the food I've eaten in my time, this is all right. This is good. <laughs> hey, uh, talking to that, uh, where's the little bloke? Who? Uh, Tucker. He seasick too? Ah, talk of the devil. Come and sit down, Mr. Tucker. Please, all of you, the name is Tucker. I do wish you'd try to remember that. Oh, well, does it matter what they call you as long as they got your name spelt right in the old bloke's will? That's the main thing as far as I'm concerned. You're a man after my own heart, Mr. Miller. You're concerned only with the essentials. Mr. Kennel, how long will we be at sea? At least a month. We'll water and bunker at Papete and stop over at Panama, of course. There is one thing I do not understand. Why was it so necessary that we travel like this together? Well, Mr. Challoner, that was made quite clear in the letter from Jamaica. After all, who are we to argue with the eccentricities of such a very generous man as Mr. Werriman? I do wish I could remember where I met him. Yeah, hey, me too. Why would a complete stranger up and leave me all that beautiful money? <laughs> Should be more of it, of course. My father remembers meeting Mr. Werriman in India in 1933. Daddy was a subaltern in the Khyber Rifles. Mr. Werriman came to the mess. At the only time they met? Yes, I think so. <laughs> well... What did your old man do for him? Must have been something pretty worthwhile. Oh, no, that doesn't follow. I don't remember ever doing anything for anyone. Certainly not for any stranger. I have no memory of this man either. And I always remember the men that I have known. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'd better be getting on my way. Next four hours are mine. Oh, but it's only half past seven. Well, I'm relieving the skipper at eight bells. Before you go, Mr. Kendall, I should like to ask you one question. According to the letter I received from Jamaica, there were to be six of us who were going to share in Mr. Werriman's will. However, there appears to be only five of us. Mr. Tucker, um, Tuca, perhaps the captain can tell you. But there are six of us. No, Miss Fedorov. I'm only travelling with my father. Oh, how interesting. Then, if there are only five of us to share everything, we'll be better off, won't we? Oh, how? Well, don't you remember the letter you received, Mr. Miller? Oh, that letter is engraved on my heart. Should any one of us fail to arrive in Jamaica on the Tangmar, then that person forfeits his or her share. So already we are all even richer than we thought. Yeah, well, if you'll excuse me... Does that sound callous, Mr. Kendall? Well, it's not my place to say, Miss Fedorov, but I think it could have been better put. Oh. I wonder why it is that men look so much more attractive when they frown. Uh, steward, may I have some more coffee, please? Black? Uh, certainly, madam. And, Steward, I would like to stand the spoon in it. Thank you. Oh, could we talk of something else, please? I dislike thinking we might be talking lightly of someone who's dead. What? Who? Why, the missing person. The person who did not come aboard. We should respect the dead. How the heck do you work out he's dead? Is there any other reason that could prevent a man sailing to collect his share of a fortune? Perhaps he couldn't be located. In time, I mean. Miss Cheddar, that's a much nicer way to put it. But for me, the fact that he or she is not here is the important thing. Hey, what's up with you, Tuka? Tuka, please. Well, what is it? You're sitting there looking as if the world had come to an end. Nothing to be morbid about. Yeah, hey, just eat your dinner and be thankful. Might have been you, Mr. Boat. Then you would have something to complain about. Of course, catching the boat was not everything. The letter said we all had to arrive in the ship. Miss Federal. Oh, why do you say it like that? Oh, don't look so alarmed. I will be more than happy with my share. I'm only quoting the letter, that's all. It would be a pity to have come this far and then not arrive. Your coffee, madam. Oh, thank you. I um, you don't think I feel hungry after all. I think I'll go up to my cabin. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. Pardon me, Dr. Lawler. Excuse me, not feeling at all well. well what's wrong with Mr. Tukar? Oh, I should not worry, Doctor. He is nervous, I think. Ah. <laughs> I somehow think that to guarantee his arrival in Jamaica, he will lock himself in his cabin. Miss Vaderoff, he's such a frightened little man. Was there any need to make him more so? Oh, it amused me. Uh, Stuart, am I too late? I'm afraid I took 40 winks. No, sir, it's perfectly all right. Uh, Doctor... We were just talking about this, uh, Victor Werryman. Uh, did you ever meet him? Mm, I'll have the beef, thanks, George. Right, sir. Yes, I met him. A long time ago, though. In fact, I operated on him back in 1937. Hadn't any option, really. A little place called Wilton in Yorkshire. My first practice, you know. 
I was as nervous as a kitten. I'd have taken him into York if there'd been time. Then perhaps he's... Uh, was grateful to you, Dr. Lawler, for saving his life. <laughs> I'm afraid he wasn't grateful enough to pay his fees. He let me think he was a pauper and couldn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting paid now, Doc, with interest. <laughs> Dr. Lawler, did you know that there was to have been a sixth member of our party? Mm? Oh, yes, yes, I did. I know his name, too. Uh, Peter Slavin. He was killed while I was in England two and a half months ago. The papers were full of it. Uh, why? Don't you think it is a coincidence, Doctor, that you were in England at that time? I was attending a medical conference. Or a post-mortem. Miss Fader! Oh, there's no need to be upset. But it seems odd, that is all. It was greatly to your advantage that Peter Slavin should die. Was it not, Doctor? Eight bells rang out as I climbed the companionway to the bridge for the four-hourly watch. But I knew that already the seeds of suspicion were sown in this passage of the Tangma. What's our rate of knots, quartermaster? Ten knots, sir. Not bad in this sea. Hold your course, steady as she goes. After all, Dr. Lawler, though in a way the death of this man helped us all. You were there. You were in England at the time. It is a coincidence, isn't it? I'd come up to the bridge for the 8 till 12 watch, relieving Captain Gardard, who brought us to sea. As I peered through the glass at the half gale that we were bucking on our northeasterly course to Papit Tahiti, where the Tangma would bunker, I didn't know that in the dining room Dr. Martin Lawler had just informed his fellow passengers of the name of the missing beneficiary. I was thinking back to my talks with Colonel Hacking of two months before. Standing there, feeling the lift of the ship beneath my feet, it wouldn't have been hard to forget that I was Dirk Kendall of Interpol. Lee Blake, the American, had told me earlier that besides Major Challoner, Dr. Martin Lawler had been in England at the time of Slavin's death. But I was to find out later that the doctor hadn't attempted to hide the fact. You do see what I mean, Doctor, don't you? You've made yourself pretty clear, Miss Fedorov. Uh, do you think I'd admit that I was in England if I'd anything to do with Slavin's death? <laughs> you might, if you were very clever. My father and I must have been in England, too. Are you forgetting that? Then that only makes it more interesting. I don't like your implication, Miss Fedorov. But I've said nothing. I've only pointed out that... That the Doctor and Miss Challoner's father both had good reasons for wanting Peter Slavin, if that's his name out of the way. But uh, aren't you forgetting something, miss? Under the terms of our Wherryman's will, we all have. The few of us to get to Savannah Lamar, the better for the rest of us. <laughs> you are so right, Mr. Miller. Where were you at the time? In jail. <laughs> <laughs> I got the best alibi a man could have, with every copper in Sydney to back me up. Uh, uh, just a moment. Is, isn't all this rather pointless? The police will find who killed Peter Slavin. It's not our job. Surely, Doctor, they must have questioned you. Why? Once it was established that this dead man was a beneficiary. <laughs> when I said I was in England at the time, that's not strictly true. I was on the plane coming back. We'd just taken off. I read about it in the morning paper. How very fortunate for you. Then it must have happened the night before you left. Probably, yes. I was interested only because I read the report that Slavin was killed... Oddly enough, just after his picture was published. The solicitors in Jamaica had been unable to contact him. <laughs> it was none of my business. I had to get back to my practice. If you don't mind my asking, Miss Fedorov, why are you so anxious to pin this on me? I'm not a bit anxious. But someone must have done it. Someone undoubtedly did. But I don't think it was the doctor, and it certainly wasn't my father or myself. And if you don't mind, Miss Fedorov, I'd rather not talk about it anymore. That goes for me, too. 
First you have a go at poor little Tuca, now the dock and Miss Challoner. We've got to spend a lot of time cooped up on this ship, you realise that? It isn't going to be very pleasant walking around accusing people of being murderers just because this poor bloke got himself bumped off. I only want to make sure that I reach Jamaica alive. <sighs> I'm sorry to have upset you. Good night. And doctor, should any of us become sick on this voyage, I think you had better see that we recover very quickly. Hmm. Please believe that we had no part in this, Dr. Lawler. Oh, forget it, Miss Chaloner. Well, I think I'll take a walk around the deck. Either of you care to join me? Not me, Doc. When you've humped the blue as long as I have and you get a chance like this, you sit down. On this voyage, Ben Miller's going to be waited on, hand and foot. I must get back to my father. He'll be waiting for me. Ah, yeah. If you see that American bloke anywhere, Doc, tell him I'd like to see him. I knew some Yanks during the war. He might know of them. Is that infernal American in the dining room, Sharon? No, Father. I don't trust that fellow. Coming aboard at the last moment is not right. <laughs> Only a captain like Goddard in command of a tub such as this would allow it. I shall continue to eat in my cabin. But that's silly. I don't think it's silly. Bad enough having to make this trip at all, but at least I don't have to make it in the company with a lot of riffraff. Why do you automatically assume that the passengers who are going to Jamaica to share in Victor Werriman's will are all right? We don't know anything about them. And... I knew Werriman. I know the type of person he'd leave his money to. Werriman may have been eccentric, but he was a gentleman. I've met the other passengers, Daddy. Hmm? Something wrong with them? Is that what you're trying to say? Of course not. But they're from every walk of life. There's Dr. Lawler. English? Yes, I think so. Hmm, that's all right, then. What about the others? Miss Alona Fedorov. She has an accent, European, I think. Ah. Uh... And I think Mr. Miller is Australian. Australian? Hmm. Pour me a drink, Sharon. Daddy. A stiff one. But... Sharon, I will decide when I wish to drink, and I wish to drink now. You will save us both a lot of unpleasantness, if you remember. I did not bring you with me on this trip in order to change our relationship in the slightest. At least when I get my hands on this money, I'll be able to live like a gentleman again. Here, Father. Thank you. Olay. I think I'll go to my cabin, if you don't mind, Father. I'm very tired. It's about time someone did something for me. The devil, it couldn't have happened years ago, I don't know. Good night, Father. Just a moment, my dear. I want to drink your help. I'm very tired. To you, Sharon Chalanam. Twenty-five years old, with your life in front of you. My daughter. If you hadn't been born, my dear... My wife, my dearest Catherine, would be travelling with me. Sleep well, Sharon. Sleep well. Only another two hours, Quartermaster, we can turn in. Oh, I'm glad it's not us for the dog watch. Oh, you can say that again, Mr. Kendall. Billings is the second mate to do that one. Well, she rides it well, though. Yeah, it laid down in 1920, she was, sir. But they were still building them to take to the sea. <laughs> uh, Captain got out of our visitors on the bridge? No, sir. Well, then I'd better hop down the companionway and cut off Dr. Lawler. Looks as though he's heading this way. Well, what would a passenger want to be on deck at this time of night for? <laughs> if it was me, I'd be in my bunk. Harris, I'll only be a couple of minutes. Okay, Mr. Kendall. <laughs> Nothing a junior officer likes better than having the bridge to himself, Mr. Kendall. Fine. Oh, well, sir. Mm -hmm. A while, I think of it. On this watch, we don't ring the seven bells. Skipper don't approve. Why not? Well, there's a lot of old-timers like that, sir. That was the time they started the mutiny on the bounty, you know. Seven bells. 11.30. Superstition, I suppose. Anyway, we don't ring them. Lola! Dr. Lola! I think you'd be safer below, Doctor, unless you feel like setting your own broken leg. Yes, it is pretty rough, isn't it? As a matter of fact, I'm walking off my temper. I thought you were heading for the bridge. Captain Goddard wouldn't approve. Well, I was. Was something wrong? Mm, no, not really. It's a little annoying, to say the least, on your first night at sea to be accused of murder. What? Uh, come back here, out of the wind. 
Yes, I'm sorry to bother you on our first night out. I'd probably have thought better of it anyway. The skipper's below, Doctor. If there's anything on your mind, you'd better tell me. Well, we were talking at dinner, that's all, and the subject of the sixth beneficiary came up. I was the only one who knew his name. You knew it? How? I read it in the paper, just after the plane that was bringing me back from England had taken off. Apparently, he'd been killed the night before. Dr. Lawler, when you came aboard, didn't you say that this was the first holiday you'd had in years? <laughs> Have you ever attended a medical conference? No, 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 I don't suppose you have. Well, I can assure you that for a doctor, it's a pretty solid grind. To be like you, taking a holiday and spending it, well, skippering a tug. <laughs> yes, go on. Oh, well, that's all, really, except that Miss Fedorov seemed to think that because I knew Slavin's name, and he was the chap who was killed, I must know something more. Stupid, really. <laughs> uh, that's all. Well, I'm new to this berth, but I've heard enough already to know why you and the others are going to Jamaica. It's not unnatural for people to be a little edgy when there's a million pounds involved. <laughs> no, 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 I suppose not. <laughs> you say none of the others knew this man's name? Well, they said they didn't. No, of course, Tuka had just gone and the Major wasn't at dinner. Hmm. Well, I'd better get back to the bridge, Doctor. I wouldn't let it get you down. No, 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 it doesn't anymore. But I do wish Wherryman hadn't made that asinine ruling. Ruling? In his will. But any one of us who didn't arrive on the Tangmar loses his or her share of the estate. It seems to me we're going to be watching each other like hawks. <laughs> well, good night, Mr. Kendall. I watched Dr. Martin Lawler edging his way along the sloping decks and remembering Colonel Hacking's instructions. I found myself wondering if he was as straightforward as he obviously wanted me to believe. Or was he the killer I was searching for on this passage of the Tangmark? Fog's getting worse. Slow ahead, quartermaster. Slow ahead, Captain Goddard. Passage of the Tangmar. The story of a ship and its cargo of death. Hey, listen, Edwin Tuca. Ain't I met you someplace before? I've been trying to place you for the last two days. For 48 hours, the Tangmar had ploughed steadily along at between 10 and 12 knots. First in the teeth of a gale, and then a fog. Fog that parted reluctantly, just enough to let us through and then blanketed the decks. On watch, peering into it for hours at a time, it wasn't long before you started to see things. Shadows that might be ships steering a collision course. In that 48 hours since the first night at sea, none of us had set eyes on Edwin Tuca, and I'd gone below to make sure that the poor fellow was all right. The frightened little man who'd let me into his cabin was hard to reconcile with the wife poisoner Colonel Hacking had claimed him to be. Tuca had been taking his meals in his cabin, and while he thanked me for looking in on him, he made it pretty clear that he wanted to be left alone. It was at that moment that Ben Miller appeared at the door, and as he spoke, the color drained from Tuca's face. No. Uh, no, Mr. Miller, I'm quite sure we haven't met. Gentlemen, if you don't mind, I'd like to rest at night. But no one's going to eat you, Ed. What are you so blooming scared of? You're not still thinking of what uh, that Miss Faderov said, are you? She was only ribbing you. It was the way she said it, Mr. Miller. You remember that to get this money, each one of us had to arrive in Savannah Lamar? Listen, if that's the reason you're remaining in your cabin, then forget it. Nothing's going to happen to you aboard well, the Tangma. Before, Ed. Mr. Kendall, when we get to Jamaica... 
Uh, I mean, is this ship going straight to Savannah Lamar? No, no, you'll travel overland from Kingston. As I understand it, you'll be met in Kingston by Victor Wenneman's solicitors, Brancher, Brancher and Smith. Oh, uh, do you have to go now? No, I've got the dog watch, 12 till 4 a.m., but uh, I, I thought you wanted to rest. No, uh, no, I've changed my mind. You ever been inside, Ed? Inside? Clink! Jail! I... I don't know what you mean, sir, and... Ah, uh... oh, don't get on your bike, Ed. Only a question, same as any other. Nothing to be ashamed of if you have. Me, I've been inside so many times, you know what the cops call me? The amateur. Insult, that is. But they got a reason. Doesn't matter how I plan it, it's always the same. They know it's me. Just when I'm congratulating myself that I got away with a neat job, I open the door, and there they are. Two hulking great blokes in blue waiting to lumber me. It's heartbreaking. How could you joke about having been a, a jailbird, a convict? How can I you... I got it. Tucker. Edwin Tucker. Melbourne. You didn't want to be known as Tucker then, did you? <laughs> uh, and what were you in for? Really, Mr Miller, I assure you, you have the wrong dad. I've never been in prison. 1935. And, uh... Doesn't that ring a bell, Ed? Come on, tell us. Pentridge it was, it... Yeah... I remember the case. And you know what told me? You, just now. How can you joke, you said. How can you joke about a woman who slurps her soup? That was what you said in court when they tried you for killing your wife. You poisoned her and watched her slurp her soup for the last time. Mr. Miller, please. Why have you got to be afraid of this Fadroff woman for, eh? Always give her some of the soup, can't you? Miller. Oh, forget it, Mr. Kendall. I'm only joking. Promise me you won't tell any of the other passengers, please. I've made a new life for myself. I saw. On deck, seeing you off. Nah, I ain't gonna blab on you. How long do they keep you in? Fifteen years. That's why I've been staying in my cabin. If anything happens, I shall be blamed. I know I will. The police wouldn't bother to look any further. They just pin it onto me. Well, I told you, I've been inside myself. They might just as soon pin it on me. Did you ever kill anyone? Me? I couldn't. Wouldn't have the nerve. Listen, both of you, just because Peter Slavin was killed in England doesn't mean that the rest of you are in danger. I can look after myself. Was that his name? Uh, yeah, Doc Lawler told us. He read about him in the paper. On his way home from England. He was there at the time? Now, don't you start. We had enough of that from a loner blooming fader off. If you're really concerned about being brought into this, Mr. Tuker, there's an easy way out. Were you in England three months ago? That was when Peter Slavin was killed. Why, I... Well? Three months ago. Almost, yes. After we heard the news about the Wedding Estate and how wealthy I was to become, well, Myrtle, that's my second wife, insisted that as she couldn't come along with me on the Tangmar to Jamaica, we should go for a trip. You see, we never had a honeymoon. Mr. Kendall, we sailed to England. When? That's why Myrtle was so very worried when I came aboard the Tangmar. She knows how frightened I am of the sea. She knows because we made that trip. We stayed in England for a fortnight only, Mr. Kendall. It's ten weeks to the day since our ship left on its return voyage to Australia. But I didn't kill anyone, Mr. Kendall. You've got to believe that. I didn't. I didn't. Now steady now. No one's accusing you of anything. Take it easy. <laughs> I, I'd like to be alone, if you don't mind. Please. I'm feeling very tired. Come in. Oh, Dick. Come on in. Sit down. If you can find a space. Drink? No, thanks. Don't mind if I go ahead? Not at all. Anything on your mind? Supposing I told you that Major Challoner and Dr. Lawler weren't the only people in England at the time Peter Slavin was killed. Oh, I'm all ears. Edwin Tucker, or Tucker as he was called when Ben Miller knew him in Pentridge Jail, he was there. He just admitted it to me in his cabin. You don't say. The wife poisoned eh? Yeah, he's petrified with fright. According to Ben Miller, the little fellow didn't even know the name of the missing beneficiary. Could be he's the guy we're looking for. Yeah, it could be. What I can't understand is this. If all these people were there at the time, why weren't they rounded up? 
I wonder if Colonel Hacking knew they were there. Not from what he told me. Well, I don't know. He's got his own way of doing things. He knew that everyone who had a reason for wanting Slave and Dead would be aboard the Tangmar for this trip. Even the cleverest killer makes a mistake somewhere along the line. I've got a month to watch for that mistake. Dirk, what's your opinion of the skipper? Well, good sailor. First rate. He's been with my father a long time. Joined the Blake Shipping Company years ago as third officer. What's that got to do with Tuca? Nothing, but I was thinking, shouldn't we take him into our confidence? I mean, after all, it's his ship. If there's a killer aboard... No dice, Lee. Sorry. Okay, I'll go along with that. But he's not going to like it when he finds out the truth. Well, let's hope he doesn't have to. Uh Uh-huh. How's the fog? You been on deck at all? Clearing. Must be. We're picking up speed. Three of whom we know, but I don't see Challoner in the role of murderer. Or Dr. Lawler. So, that leaves Tuker. Uh, perhaps. What will you do when you pin it down? Well, I'll attend to that when the time comes. Because there's one thing about Challoner that neither of us should overlook. This inheritance means a devil of a lot to him. According to the colonel, he hasn't much money. Who does? I saw the major on deck this morning, but uh, he made a point of not seeing me. I gather he doesn't approve the way I came aboard at the last moment. Well, I've yet to find anything the major does approve of. Including his daughter, Sharon. She seems a nice enough girl, but a very quiet one. I showed her to her cabin just before we sailed. Challoner came in as she was trying to excuse his rudeness about the ship. And he went for her. Then me. I don't envy Miss Challoner one little bit. I heard her crying in her cabin our first night out. I think before we reach Jamaica, I might have me a piece of the major. That I would like to see. Sure you won't? Positive, thanks. Just tell me one thing, Dirk. Do you really think Peter Slavin's killer is aboard the Tangmar? I wish I knew. But you can't escape the fact that Wherryman's solicitors had been unable to trace Slavin, and yet on the day they ran his photograph in the paper, he was killed. Colonel Hacking is sure that the murder was committed by a person or persons who knew the terms of Victor Wherryman's will. But anyone not arriving in Jamaica aboard the Tangmar automatically lost his or her share of the loot. One million pounds between six. And now between five. That's a lot of loot. I'll drink a toast to the five of them. (laughs) Here's to Victor Wherryman. You won't forget, will you, Dirk? If anything comes up, I want to be in on it. Likewise. Well, I'll be seeing you, pal. Me? I have a date with a glamorous alone of Fedorov. Wish me luck. You can even see the stars now, quartermaster. Going to be a nice night after all. Be a change after all that fog, sir. Yes. Oh, I think I'll go below. You take over up here, Harris. Aye, aye, sir. Harris, this is the Merchant Marine, not the Royal Navy. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Look, Harris. Oh, never mind. Uh, Captain Goddard, sir. My... What the... Stop engines, quartermaster. Man overboard! Man overboard! The night was clearing as I came on deck. And then I heard the scream and saw the head bobbing in the phosphorescent water. Was death already a passenger on this passage of the Tangmar? Pull ahead, quartermaster. Pull ahead, sir. We'll bring her around and make a search for Tuker. We should pick him up on this circle if he's still afloat. Hope the little fool can swim, that's all. Keep your eyes skinned up forward. We don't want to be searching all night. Our third night out from Sydney. And the stars clear in the cloudless sky. 
I'd heard the scream as Edwin Tuker went overboard and Captain Goddard had ordered the engine stopped at once. Now we were beating back in a circle to starboard, with every member of the crew peering into the night. Not half an hour before he fell or was pushed overboard, I'd been talking to Edwin Tuker in his cabin. And when we picked him up, I wanted to know one thing. Who or what was it that had been important enough to drag that frightened little man on deck? If the killer of Peter Slavin, the sixth beneficiary, was aboard the Tangmar, then he wasn't wasting any time. And then the cry came back from the bows. There he is, sir, on the port bow. He's lucky the fog cleared. Darn lucky. Stop engines. Engines, stop, sir. Get a boat away, Mr. Kendall. Friends up to it. You can see him clearly now, sir. Seems to be struggling to stay afloat. Both sides, number one boat, port bow. Get it swung out. Lower it away there. I knew it before we left, Harris. This is one charter that Tangma should never have taken on. Get that boat away! Load away there! I figured you wouldn't mind my coming along, Dick. All right, keep at it, boys. Come on, come on! You realize you've busted my date with the loner. When we get back, Captain Goddard's likely to bust your neck. Passengers are supposed to stay out of this kind of job. There he is, dead ahead of us. Hold on, Tuka! For a guy who can't swim, he's done all right so far. He's so frightened he's throwing his arms about enough to stay afloat. He's gone under, Mr. Kendall. Well, I'll get him. Ship on. Nice night for a dip, Dick. Let's hope I'm not wasting my time, that's all. Tuka! Tuka! <laughs> I'm going to drown. Oh, I've got you. <laughs> Don't struggle, you fool. Don't. Save me. Save me. Look, just lie back, Tuka. I've got you. No, no, help. Help. Help me. Oh, my Tuka, you asked for it. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, Tuka, but I don't intend to lose you now. Nice work, Kendall. Here, you give me a hand. Uh, Grab the little black boy. Uh, uh, there we are. Yeah. Look like he was going to take you with him to yeah. a watery grave, Kendall. Well, at least I didn't have to go under for him. He came up right in front of me. All right, get those oars moving. Let's get back to the ship. Yeah, Tuka. Hey, Tuka. You all right now? Tuka. Oh, oh, don't let me drown. I'm going to drown. Don't leave me. No! I'll let him be, Kendall. You won't get anything out of him now. The sooner we get back aboard and let Dr. Lawler take a look at him, the better. Oh, how is he, Doctor? No, oh, he'll be all right. I've given him a sedative. Did he say anything about how it happened? No, Captain. I couldn't get anything out of him at all. The poor little blighter still can't believe that he's on board again. He kept grabbing at me. If you ask me, Captain... I didn't, Mr. Blake. And I'd be grateful, mighty grateful, if you'd go about your own business. You had no right to join that boat's crew. I'll take that up with you later, Mr. Kendall. No good Kendall. blaming Dirk, Skipper. If he stopped to argue with me, we would have been wasting time, I guess. Main thing was to get Tuker. I only wanted to help. When I need you to assist my crew, I'll let you know, Blake. Okay, okay. I can tell when I'm in the way. So long, folks. Looks like I'll make that date for the loaner after all. Sorry if you're going to collect on my account, Dirk. All right, if we go in and talk to him, Doctor. It might be an idea if I came too, just in case he needs calming down. Uh, come on, then. Let's get it over. Mm. Well, there's no need to look so miserable, Kendall. I saw you arguing with Blake in the boat. But if it had been me, I'd have thrown him out. Yes. Ah, well, how are you feeling now, Mr. Tuka? Any better? Yes. Yes, Doctor. I want to thank you, Mr. Kendall. You saved my life and... Well, that can wait. How did it happen? I uh, don't know. What? Well, you see, uh, I was up on deck. I I wasn't feeling very well, and... Uh, well, well I, I just went to the side of the ship and... Oh, uh... uh, nothing wrong with that. You're not the first man to be seasick. But I never was before on the way to England, never. Oh, that's the way it goes. Well, then what happened? Well, it just seemed to be falling. Were you pushed? 
I don't think so. What the blazes does that mean? Were you or weren't you? It all happened so fast, you see. I, I, I don't think so. I see. You weren't feeling sick when I talked to you, Mr. Duker. Well, no, Mr. Kendall. But after you left, I had my dinner and then, well, if, then it happened. I felt I just had to get out on deck. Well, you'd better get some rest. And in future, I'd advise you to stay away from the decks at night. Oh, I will, Captain, I will. Good. If we'd still been in that fog, you wouldn't be here now, Mr. Tuker. Remember that. And there's another thing. It's my job to get you to Jamaica. And if I have to lock you in your cabin, I'm going to do just that. You'd better come to my cabin before you go on and watch Mr. Kendall to make a report for the lock. Good night, Tuker. Good night, Captain Goddard. You think you'll be all right now? Yes, Doctor, thank you. Well, I'll be in my cabin if you want me. Good night, Mr. Kendall. Good night. You're just as well you're safe on board. I'd have hated to face Miss Fader off if we'd lost you. Tuker, listen to me. When you went up on deck, did you see anyone? Um, no. No, not a soul. You sure? Quite sure. Oh, please don't frighten me anymore. I don't want to believe that anyone pushed me. All right, you fell. We'll leave it at that. But if you notice anything suspicious, the slightest thing at all, I want you to come straight to me now. Is that clear? Quite, yes, yes. And, and Mr. Kendall, thank you again. There's only twice in my whole life I've ever been afraid of dying. Once in the dock when I was on trial for my life, and just now in the water. What do you figure happened? He was pushed. I'm sure of it. Why? Do you know why we are all going to Jamaica? The major, the doctor, Mr. Miller, Mr. Tucker, and myself? I have heard something about it, yeah. If only one of us were to arrive, then he would collect all the money. You say he. But supposing it was a she? <laughs> Since I am the only woman who is included in the will, that must apply to me. Do you think me capable of murder, Lee? Loner, I have the feeling that you always get what you want. Mm. I want you to kiss me, Lee. I figured you might. Now. You know something, Loner? I like a woman who makes the nicest tasks so easy. Mm. Loner. <laughs> what could be more romantic? The night sounds of a ship at sea. And being held in your arms like this. See, where did you learn to kiss like that, honey? Mm -hmm. Was something wrong? No, no. But when I kiss someone, I like to feel that I'm not being compared to a long line of embraces. <laughs> compared and filed away for future efforts. How dare you? Hey, take it easy. I thought you might be different to the others, but you're just the same. Smug and so sure of yourself. You want a woman to fall into your arms and sigh that she loves you. Don't you think she has a right to make her choice? Nothing wrong that I can see, providing the choice agrees with her. I find you very exciting, Lee. Different. To whom? Oh, the ones in China, Hong Kong, and in all the places. England? <laughs> England? <laughs> oh, they are so stuffy. They do not want to be. They can desire you and long for you, but when they kiss you, it is as if at the moment of reaching for you, they become frightened. Frightened that the mask of Anglo-Saxon reserve might fall and reveal them for what they are. And that is? Oh, I don't want to talk about them. I would much rather talk about us. We could make this voyage so pleasant for each other. Why not? Mm -hmm. When were you in England, Alona? Oh, just a few months ago when... Why? Why do you ask? Oh, no reason. Just talk and that's all. Lee, I would... I would rather... Much rather... That this is a secret between us. I do not want anyone to know that I was in England. Do you promise?
So Ilona Fedorov had been in England just a few months before, and she wanted it kept secret. Lee Blake was not slow to keep me posted with developments. Now it seemed that besides Major Challoner, Dr. Lawler, and Edwin Tuker, Miss Fedorov might have been the killer we were searching for on this passage of the Tangma. Good night, Harris. Oh, hello, Dirk. Hey, you feeling all right? Cannot join the bridge to Lake Bells. Passage of the Tangma. The story of a ship and its cargo of death. Please, Lee, it is very important. You must promise me that you will never tell anyone that I was in England when this man Slavin was killed. I'd gone up to the bridge of the Tangmar at about 20 to 12 midnight. I was due on watch at eight bells, but pacing up and down in my cabin trying to work out whether or not Edwin Tuker had been pushed overboard wasn't getting me anywhere. It was a clear night. I could see Lee Blake and Ilona Fedorov standing close together on the deck. Lee might have been aboard to help me find Peter Slavin's killer, but it was pretty obvious he wasn't letting business interfere with pleasure. I didn't know until later that the American had just found another passenger who had been in England at the time of Slavin's death. The exotic Miss Fedorov who'd been so anxious to make us all suspicious of Dr. Lawler and the Major. If the last 48 hours were a sample of what the voyage to Jamaica was going to be like, it promised that at least I wouldn't have time to be bored. You must do as I say, Lee. Promise that you will. Well, what makes it so important? The fact that I ask it, isn't it enough? Is it something to do with the murder of Peter Slavin? How do you know anything about that? On this ship? Are you kidding seems to be the main topic of conversation. Oh, it frightens me to be so close to security at last. So close and yet... And yet what? Oh, I will try to make you understand. Ever since I can remember, I've had to fight for the things I wanted from life. Fight with the only weapons I have. <laughs> you must have won a lot of victories. Oh, let us walk a little, please. I grew up in China. I was born there. My father was killed in the Russian Revolution, and my mother fled along with thousands of other white Russians to China. I suppose she was luckier than some of her friends. She married again. But it made no real difference to her. She lived only for the day when we would return to the world she had known as a girl, the luxury and glitter of the Russian court. I don't think she even saw the teeming millions of people who fought daily to get enough to eat, but I saw it. I saw it all. From as far back as I can remember. In Hankov, Canton, Hong Kong. But you managed to get away from China, eh? I came to Australia as an immigrant, just after the war. My mother was dead. There was nothing to keep me with the man she'd married. Since then, Lee, there have been only little times when I was short of money. It's not so difficult to find a protector. And after you collect your share of the Wherryman estate? For the first time in my life, I shall be able to please myself. Not to listen to this dull talk and laugh. Not to look interested when I'm so bored I could scream. Yeah, I get your point. But why is it so important that no one should know you were in England? Um, because of a man, the, the man who took me there. Not Peter Slavin? Uh, no, no, no. I, I left this man and returned to Australia and found the letter from Jamaica waiting for me. I, and I found something else. A man named Keith who wanted to marry me. I have such a child... I said goodbye to him on the day we sailed. Yeah, this uh, other man... Oh, Lee, isn't there any part of your life that you would like to forget? That is why I I do not wish to talk of England. It is finished. All the past is finished. 
Yeah, I guess we'd better turn in, Alona. You haven't promised? No, I guess I haven't. And you haven't told the truth, have you? What? There wasn't any man who took you to England. That's an excuse you dreamed up because you're terrified of one thing. Now that you're so close to this independence you speak of, you might miss out. And for why? Because you were in England at the time of Slavin's death, and you had as good a reason as any of the other beneficiaries to bump him off. Right? How dare you speak to me like this? Look, Ilona, whether you did or not is beside the point. But don't bring me out here on deck and think that you can twist me around that little finger of yours by falling into my arms. You can't. You're getting an episode, unpleasant episode. What do you take me for? Good night. Lee? Please come back, Lee? What now? You're right, I am frightened. I read of this man's death and returned to Australia at once. Then you heard from Jamaica before you went to England, huh? Yes, yes. Oh, Lee, can't you understand? It was as if the money was already in my hand. I wanted to spend it, to enjoy life. To... So you decided to take a sea trip, huh? And then when you read of Slavin's death, you remember the letter which stipulated that should any one of you fail to arrive in Jamaica, his or her share went to the others. So you panicked and ran, right? Right. There's only one thing, Elona. If I were you, I'd go easy on the other passengers. The way you've been trying to point the bone, they're likely to point it right back if they ever find out. Isn't that up to you? I promise you one thing, Elona. They won't find out, not from me. Come on. I'd better take you to your cabin. You're very quiet, Sheldon. Something wrong? I didn't sleep very well, that's all. Well, then let's step it out a little, blow some of the cobwebs away. You go on, Father. I'll sit here. Mm. You're not sickening for anything, are you? Would it matter? I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Please try to make an effort, Father. We've been in this boat for three days now, and apart from this early morning walk around the deck, you stay in your cabin. I have to face the other passengers. To make excuses? Is that it? Well, don't. Tell them the truth. But I prefer my own company. Fine bunch they are, anyway. Do you expect me to take kindly to a fellow who's such a fool that he falls overboard? They seem very nice people. Well, then you talk to them. Make up for both of us. Why did you bring me with you, Father? You're my daughter, aren't you? You insist that I go everywhere with you, and yet all you do is remind me that... Sometimes when I look at you, Sam, it's as if your mother was still here. I almost start to call you Catherine, and... And then I remember. Is mother the reason you gave up the army? I've told you before, Sharon, I don't want to talk about the army. Those days are finished. It's an army I don't understand anymore. When any jumped-up little fool can get a commission, you'd have to meet them in the club. They're not interested in the army as a career. Never even think of it in peace time. Then when war starts, they get promoted over the heads of men who've given their life to the army. Major. Major in 39, major in 42. I was glad to get out of it. But it seems such a waste. Does it? Let them have their amateur soldiers. But when we get back to England, I'll meet those fellas on their own ground. No need to try and make a pension stretch out anymore, Sharon. When we get back home, Major Challoner will be somebody. <laughs> I'll bet there'll be a few of them who'll come begging for favors then. <laughs> Is that all this money means to you? I think I'll finish my walk, Sheridan. You arrange my breakfast to be sent to the cabin? Yes, Father. And ask that infernal steward if he can't arrange to serve my toast without burning it to a crisp. Morning, Kendall. Morning, Major. Taking a turn around the deck, eh? Remarkable deduction, Kendall. <laughs> Remarkable. What kind of a reaction do I get if I mention that you appear not to be taking a turn around the deck, Miss Challoner? I'm so used to apologising for Father's rudeness that it's almost second nature. You mind if I sit down? Not at all. As a first officer, it's my duty to see that the passengers are enjoying themselves, Miss Challoner. You don't appear to be. Well, I... If there's anything I can do, anything at all... It's not anything to worry about. All right. Change of subject coming up. No, don't change the subject. I'd like to talk to someone. You go right ahead. Mr. Kendall, if you were... Supposing you were an only child and... Why is it that some men... 
My mother died when I was born. And I seem to have been living with that ever since. Doing a sort of perpetual penance. Yes. Over the years, I seem to have worked up such a feeling of guilt about it that... I'm sorry to trouble you with all this, but... Well, everything that happens... The fact that Daddy didn't get promoted during the war. The fact that he was invalided out of the service and watched his junior officers get ahead. All because I had the bad taste to be born at all. Do I sound very disloyal? You sound heartbroken, crying yourself to sleep in your cabin. I didn't know that anyone could hear. Did you ever try to leave him? Once. Went up to London. But he came after me and... It was much easier to go back. In a way, that's why I'm glad about the money. Because I think he'll be so busy putting up a front that he won't know whether I'm there or not. Well, he's coming back. Oh. i better be on my rounds. Good on. Hook it up, Kendall. I think you'll need a chair for this. Father, don't start anything now, Sharon, please. Go to your cabin. I wish to speak with Mr. Kendall alone. Mr. Kendall. Sharon, please. All right. Kendall, is it usual for first officers to lounge around on deck when there are things calling for their attention? Major Challenger, I think we'll both enjoy this voyage a lot more if we get one thing straight. That's what I'm trying to do. Remember, I objected to that American fellow, Lee Blake, coming aboard. But I told you he was probably connected with the wedding and the fortune in some way. Yes. If you care to go up to the boat deck, you'll find the body of that Australian, Ben Miller. <laughs> he looks very dead. The Major's voice was dispassionate, and he smiled crookedly as I left him and raced along the deck. As I looked down at the body of Ben Miller, I suddenly realized that he was the only passenger aboard who'd possessed a cast-iron alibi for the time of Peter Slavin's murder in England. The murder before this passage of the Tangmar. Have the body taken below, Kendall, and then bring Major Challoner to my cabin. If the rest of the passengers find out Miller is dead, we're likely to have a first-class panic on our hands. Now listen, Kendall, I don't care how it's done, but I want the killer of Ben Miller found before we reach Papite. There's a murderer aboard my ship, and he's got to be found. Whoever used that knife on Miller is going to finish this voyage in irons. Captain Goddard emphasized each word with a jab of his pipe as we waited in his cabin for Major Challoner to show up. The army officer had refused to leave his cabin until he'd finished his breakfast. Although how he could eat after discovering Miller was beyond me. I'd found the Australian just as the Major had said I would, sprawled on the boat deck with a knife in his back. And now there was no doubt in my mind. Colonel Hacking of Interpol had been right in his hunch that the person who killed Peter Slavin in England would strike again aboard the Tangmar in a bid to inherit a larger share of the Quirriman fortune. The sea was calm that third morning as the Tangmar eased along at a comfortable 11 knots. But as I faced the skipper, I realized that I was still fighting shadows. I joined the Tangmar to find a murderer, but Ben Miller, the fifth beneficiary had died in spite of that. Captain Goddard paced up and down as he continued. Uh, I've had a feeling about this voyage from the start, Kendall. For two pins, I'd have refused the charter. But when old man Blake makes up his mind, his captains jump through hoops. Do you think the death of Miller is tied in with the death of Slavin? I don't know. Anyway... What do you know about Slavin's death? Well, you mentioned it just before we left harbour. Oh, did I? Hmm. 
Why does this have to happen on my ship, Kendall? Captain Goddard, when the Tangmar sailed from England, did you have a full crew? Of course I did. Why? There wasn't anyone who rejoined the ship later, en route. Of course not. What the devil are you getting at, anyway? Well, I... Now, you listen to me, young fella. Find the murderer by all means. But if you're trying to pin it on a member of my crew, you've got another thing coming. It should be obvious to you that one of the passengers is responsible. Find out the ones who were in England at the time Slavin was killed and you've got what you're after. But don't think you can frame one of my men because you can't. Captain Goddard. It may interest you to know that the Tangma sailed from England the day before Slavin was killed. I got it from the owners when they arranged for Miss Challoner to have his cabin. If there is a connection between the deaths... Of course there's a connection. But there isn't a man in my ship I wouldn't vouch for with my life. Except for the passengers. As far as I'm concerned, Ben Miller could have been stabbed by anyone aboard, including you and me. You'll, um, you'll have a job fitting me with it. That's not the point. I know the passengers who stand to gain more money by Ben Miller's death are the obvious suspects, but we can't rule out the possibility they was killed for a totally different reason. All right, Kendall, handle it your own way. But I don't want anyone to know what you're after. You do all the sleuthing you want. But keep Miller's death a secret. Come in. Morning, Captain Goddard. You sent for me. I hope you enjoyed your breakfast, Major. I did. Very much. <laughs> well, don't look so horrified, Captain. The soldier allowed the sight of a corpse to put him off his food. He'd rarely eat anything. Well, let's get on with it. First of all, I take it you've kept quiet about this. It's not exactly the kind of thing one mentions in polite conversation. Well, suppose you mention it to us now. Just how did you come to find the body? I was uh, taking a turn around the deck, to use Mr. Kendall's expression. He met me, in fact. Isn't that so? Yes. Oddly enough, it occurred to me after I'd gone back to my cabin that uh, you could have been coming from the boat deck. <laughs> but I imagine not. You imagine correctly. I am glad. Anyway, it wasn't really a case of finding Miller... He was there in front of me. Almost fell over him. Only had to look at the knife to tell me he's dead. Must have been attacked by a man, that's clear. Why? On the force of the blow. Knife was buried in his back up to the hilt. Reminds me of a similar case in India. Pataan tribesmen ran amuck and attacked one of the Havildars. Oh, the poor fellow didn't have a chance. But what I am getting at is that fellow who did the stabbing was an enormous brute. <laughs> now that American, Lee Blake... A pretty big fellow, isn't he? Now, listen to me, Major. Just because you objected to Blake coming aboard, there's no point in trying to hang a murder charge on him. Well, someone must have done it. Even you. I think you'll find he'd been dead for some little time, Mr. Kendall. And even when I was serving in the army, I didn't find it necessary to kill a man by stabbing him in the back. And I don't think Lee Blake would find that necessary either. I do hope you're right. But I told you when he came aboard in Sydney that I didn't like the look of the man. I still don't. Be that as it may, I want you to understand one thing, Major Challoner. We need your help to keep this thing quiet. I don't think murder should be kept quiet. All right, then. What happens if we broadcast the fact? Have everyone aboard suspecting everybody else. Of course, if you feel so strongly about it, I could put back to Sydney. But you can't do that now. We're due in Jamaica. You've contracted to take us there. Well, then, you'd better make up your mind to keep Miller's death as quiet as possible. Apart from the three of us, Dr. Lawler is the only one who knows a thing. He's trying to establish the time of death. And how do you intend to explain his absence? I hope to get Dr. Lawler to help us there. Put out a story that Ben Miller's confined to his cabin, sick. Can we count on you, Major? I don't appear to have any choice, do I? All right, Captain. Mr. Kendall, you have my word. But I'd suggest you find the murderer of Ben Miller very quickly. For I, for one, intend to stay alive until we reach Savannah Lamar. Yes, I'd say it's pretty clear that Miller was killed about two hours before he was found. I'd say about six o'clock. Hmm. Anyone could have been up there on the boat deck. The point is, what was Miller doing there? If I knew that, Lee, I'd know who killed him. I suppose we're all under suspicion, eh? All of us, Doctor. Hmm. But as Miss Federoff would say, there are some of us who had a very good reason for wishing him dead. Have you talked to the crew, Dirk? Well, that's not so easy. Captain Goddard wants me to find the killer, but he also wants Miller's death kept quiet. He's tied my hands very neatly. 
Short of checking everyone's alibi for six o'clock this morning, I can't do a thing. Alibi? <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have an alibi. I was asleep in my cabin. Yes, so was I. Me too. I'd come off watch at four. There are 55 crew members on the Tangmar and six passengers. Now, where do I start? Mm. I don't see that you can do a thing. You can't very well put out that Miller is sick and then uh, casually accuse people of murdering him. I don't think the Major will keep it to himself for too long, anyhow. And if it's going to be talked about, I'd like to get in first. Ah, you know, Kendall, I was really looking forward to this voyage. But I'm beginning to wish I'd never heard of the Wedderman estate. At least in my surgery, I don't have to walk about with my eyes in the back of my head. I think you'd better talk to God out again, Dirk. Convince him that the only way to get to the bottom of this is to admit what's happened. It only needs one person to take a look in Miller's cabin and they could see that he wasn't there. Well, I'll leave you to it. If you want me, I'll be on deck. I think from now on I'll give the deck a wide berth after nightfall. Well, at least the doctor shares the universal opinion that Miller was bumped off by one of the beneficiaries. Incidentally, just to add to your problems... Ilona Fedorov was in England. At the time Slavin was killed, I know. They were all there. Dr. Lawler, Tuka, Ilona Fedorov, and the Major. All of them except poor Miller. Well, that settles it, Lee. I'm going to see Goddard. It's time he knew the real reason I'm aboard. Hacking wouldn't approve, but it's the only way out. You think it's one of the four? Yes, but which one, Lee? Which one? Of course, Harris. Go nor east. Hold her on that quartermaster. Okay, Skipper. Hey, what is it, Kendall? Can I see you a moment, Skipper? It's urgent. You mean you found the... Oh, uh, come over here. Take the bridge, Harris. Aye, aye, sir. If you wanted less about spit and polish, Harris, you'd realize you should have rung three bells two minutes ago. Well, Kendall... Captain Goddard, I think it's time you knew that I'm not on this ship merely as your first officer. What? You've heard of Interpol? Yes. They want to find out who killed Peter Slavin, and that's why I came aboard. I see. I was under strict orders to keep that fact a secret. I have to ask you to do that. Well, go on. But now that Ben Miller's been killed, it's time you knew the truth. I can't let you or anyone else aboard interfere with finding the murderer. Well, I haven't interfered. I can't keep Miller's death a secret just to help you, Captain. I'll handle it as discreetly as possible, but saying Miller's confined to his cabin won't get us anywhere. What do you want to do? I'll go on with my normal duties. I want the crew and the passengers to accept me as your first officer. But I've got to find that killer before he strikes again. From now on, I want the passengers guarded day and night, and I intend to handle the investigation in my own way. You can count on me, Kendall. I'll do whatever you say. I never thought I'd be happy to have a policeman for a first officer, but I am. Good hunting, Mr. Kendall. I knew that Colonel Hacking wouldn't approve. But the only way to get Captain Goddard's assistance was to tell him the truth. I left the bridge and went below, sure that now I'd find the murderer who had come aboard for this passage of the Tangmar. For Pete's sake, Harris, I turn me back and you're off course. We're heading for Papit Tahiti, not the South Pole. Nor or east, man, nor nor east. Well, Kendall, you've called us together for some good reason, I imagine. Am I talking out of turn when I assume it's connected with the death of the Australian, Mr. Ben Miller? As soon as I'd informed Captain Goddard that I was an agent for Interpol and that I had to have a free hand to investigate the death of Miller, 
I'd gone below and requested the passengers bound for Savannah Lamar to meet me in the forward lounge. While we waited for the Major, I watched the others. Ilona Fedorov, Dr. Martin Lawler, and Edwin Tuker. And I listened to the nervous small talk that eddied and died in sudden self-conscious coughs. Lee Blake looked in for a moment and signaled that he was leaving me to it. Apart from anything else, he was the one man aboard who couldn't have killed Ben Miller. The American had shipped out on the Tangmar only to protect the interests of his father's steamship line. He and the captain were the two men who knew that I was with Interpol. I wondered how soon I'd have to reveal that fact to the others. Then the door opened to admit Major Basil Challoner, ex-Indian Army. And his first words killed the small talk. Death, did you say, Major Challoner? Why, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kendall. Is that still on the top secret list? Dr. Lawler, would you mind shutting the door? Uh, yes, certainly. Very mm, hush-hush. Behind closed doors, eh? You are joking, aren't you, Major Challoner? No, he's not, Mr. Tuker. That's why I asked you to meet me here. You feel that we are the uh, logical suspects, is that it? Uh, let's hear it from Mr. Kendall, eh, Major? Oh, but I thought it was to be treated as taboo. Weren't you and Mr. Kendall conspiring to keep Miller's death a secret? Then why did you mention it when you came in? At my age, one has very few chances of making a sensational entrance. Well, as it happens, it doesn't matter now. I persuaded Captain Goddard that the only way to find the person responsible was to start from scratch. Miller is dead. He was murdered. Stabbed in the back with this knife at four bells this morning. Mr. Kendall, do you mind? Four bells means nothing to me. At six o'clock. Thank you. The Major found his body on the boat deck at about eight o'clock, right, Major? Correct. But how dreadful. I cannot believe it. I assure you, there's no mistake. I examined the body. Although Miller could have been killed by anyone on board, it seems logical to assume that the people who stood to gain most by his death should be cleared first. Is that a tactful way of accusing us, Mr. Kendall? Miss Fedorov, I think you should know one thing. There has been considerable talk on this ship about the death of Peter Slavin in England, the beneficiary who was killed nearly three months ago. I believe that the same person killed Ben Miller. Whether or not that person also pushed Mr. Tuker overboard is not yet clear. In any case, Mr. Tuker found a dramatic method of removing suspicion from himself. Perhaps the rest of us should fall overboard and be unable to remember whether we were pushed or merely fell. Do you seriously think I'd risk drowning for such a reason? Mr. Kendall, I oh, beg you... Oh, forget it, Mr. Tuker. It seems that on this ship it's quite a parlor game to suspect each other. Isn't that what you're doing now? Yes, Major. For a very good reason. How I know doesn't matter, but each one of you were in England when Slavin was killed. Each one of you was aboard the Tangmar this morning when Miller was murdered. Whoever told you that I was in England was lying. Just a moment, Miss Fedorov. Do you deny that you were in England three months ago? I... Uh, the American told you. He promised me. Then you were there. Yes. Well, now, is that why you were so anxious to pin Slavin's death on me, Miss Fedorov, on our first night out? Dr. Lawler, I had a very good reason for not admitting I had been overseas. Or that you even knew Slavin's name. I'm not a murderer. I'm glad to hear it. Instead I... of accusing each other, supposing I'd tell you that I resent your suspicions, Kendall, that I am not in the habit of being insulted in this manner. Major Charles. I can assure you that if you try to accuse me of this crime, you will regret it. I would like nothing better than to have you air your libelous remarks in a court of law. I might yet have to do that. But the fact remains that now there are only four beneficiaries under Victor Wedderman's will. Four, Major. You will admit that the million that you were all to share will go considerably further now. It is a matter of supreme indifference to me. I've always been poor at mathematics. Divide a million pounds by six or four. There's not much difference, surely. At the moment, it seems there's enough difference to account for two deaths. All you have to do is to answer a very simple question. Two, in fact. Firstly, have you, any of you, ever seen this knife before? Of course not. Never. I have a phobia about knives, Mr. Kendall. Dr. Lawler? No. Major Challoner? Yes, I've seen it before. You uh, have? You... This morning, of course, very firmly planted in Miller's back. Oh, I find this discussion quite pointless, Mr. Kendall. If excuse me, I have some letters to write. Perhaps when we reach Savannah Lemaire, this matter will be handled by a professional investigator. I suggest you leave it to him, Mr. Just Kendall. a moment, Major. Well... The second question. 
Where was I at six o'clock this morning? Supposing you find that out. The Major is right. You have no reason to question any of us. I agree. How dare you assume we would resort to violence? If that was the second question, Mr. Kendall, I've already told you I was in my cabin, asleep. Thanks, Doctor. Well, for the time being, that's all. But it's not the end by a long shot. We won't reach Jamaica for almost another month. That's a long time for a killer to lie low. Drink, Kendall? No, thanks. You know, I've been thinking about what you said to me on the bridge. Why didn't the owners tell me that you were from Interpol? I suppose they didn't want you to be involved in any way. It's your job to run the ship. Mine to protect the passengers. Do you have to do that? Oh, sorry. I've seen hundreds of knives like that. I dare say there are dozens of them aboard. Seaman's knives. Nothing special about it. Except that it killed a man. I've arranged for a couple of crewmen to patrol the passengers' quarters tonight, just in case. Thanks. You know, Major Challoner might have something. I've been worrying about taking Lee Blake aboard ever since I heard about Miller. You don't have to worry in regard to Blake, Captain. I give you my word, he's on the level. Supposing, for the sake of argument, there was something we didn't know of in Weddyman's will. What do you mean? Well, perhaps... It's to someone's advantage for none of the beneficiaries to arrive. Perhaps there's an outsider who stands to gain by that. You mean that Wellyman might have left his money to these people provisionally, that if none of them show up, then it goes to someone else? Exactly. Well, aren't you going back on what you said before? That implies that the murderer we're looking for must be one of your crew. Or Lee Blake. Oh, I see. Cheers. It's, um, it's just a thought. Hmm. Captain, do you mind if I wire ahead to Jamaica? It might be possible to get a complete copy of Werryman's will. Not at all. Give Sparks something to do. Brancher, Brancher and Smith. Werryman's solicitors. I'll get Sparks onto it straight away. I'm flattered to be getting all this attention, Dirk. First the Major, now the Captain. I can see the way things are going. I'll be in the brig before we reach Jamaica. The Major's kept hammering at the skipper ever since you came aboard. Suspicious character, that Lee Blake. Now he's got the skipper doing it, too. He's a good man, Goddard. My father's got a lot of time for him. Says they don't make masters like him anymore. I did a lot of sleuthing myself this afternoon, by the way. It uh, seems that none of the crew have lost an eye. How did you explain that question? Said that I'd found one, that's all. Did you get the feeling that they know what's going on? Well, they know something's up. Could feel it. Miller's death will be all over the ship by morning. Incidentally, I'd say Lona Fedorov was gunning for you. I had to reveal the fact that I knew she'd been in England at the crucial time. Yeah, I know. She ignored me in the dining room tonight. Very Slavic, very haughty. Sorry. You had better company than me last night up here. Oh, so you saw us, huh? Well, she's a very attractive girl. I don't think there'll be too many of them willing to face the deck after nightfall from now on. No, I guess not. Well, I think I'll be turning in. You coming down? No, I'm due on the bridge. Almost eight o'clock. So long, then. Oh, dear. Watch your step. I gather you're number one unpopular boy in the tank bar right now. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not coming into any of that money then. Good night. Oh, Colonel Hacking, you sure handed me a prize job. Should have just stayed at sea, Dirk, my boy. No complications, no Interpol. <laughs> Who killed Cock Robin? Who? <coughs> what name? <coughs> A knife. Oh, no, you don't. Give me that knife. <coughs> Yes. 
In the darkness on deck, I swayed back, holding the wrist of my unknown attacker. Above me, the knife gleamed dully as I staggered across the rail. In that moment, I knew that I was fighting for my life in this passage of the Tangmar. <laughs> 